Hello, and welcome to the final episode of our series from Concept to PCB. As you can see, we have a different setup today. That is because in this episode, we will finally assemble our printed circuit board. In previous episodes, we designed a custom RP2350 development board with integrated Wi-Fi using the SILS design platform. We imported the SILS generated schematic into Autodesk Fusion, completed the PCB layout and routing, finalized everything, creating a 3D model of the board. Now it's time to bring that design to life. In this episode, we will prepare and generate PCB manufacturing files, assemble and solder our board, and finally, program the RP2350 using the USB bootloader. By the end, you'll have a fully assembled and programmed RP2350 development board ready to plug in into your next application. I'll get you to this setup later, but for now, let's start by generating our manufacturing files on Autodesk Fusion. On Autodesk Fusion, open the layout file you want to manufacture. On the Manufacturing tab, on the Navigation panel, click on CAM Processor. A CAM job template matching your layer stack up will be pre-selected. This template is typically a good starting point. In the left panel, you'll find different output files. Gerber files define the geometries on the copper layers, solder mask layers, solder paste and seal screen layers. The information on each of these layers will be used by the manufacturer to build your board. You'll also have drill files that contain the drilling information of your board. And under assembly, you'll find a bill of materials and a pick and place file. Pick and place files are used for automatic placement of components using specialized machinery. If you are going to use assembly services from your manufacturer, you'll probably require these type of files from you. You'll also see an ODB++ output file type. ODB++ is a more complex output format with other manufacturing metadata like components, net lists, holes, and dimensions. While this and other more advanced cat cam formats have advantages, the simplicity and ease of interpretation of Gerber formats, combined with the fact that it's a non-proprietary format, makes Gerber files an easier solution for most simple boards. Follow the links in the description to learn more about different cat cam formats. Before exporting, inspect the Gerber and Drill files output per view. Make sure there are no missing features, such as pads or board outlines. One common issue is when you use footprints that use the milling layer to generate slots in your board without including it on the profile layer. If this is the case, don't forget to add the milling layer. And sometimes a solder mask opening might be missing from a pad on a footprint, which will cause the pad to be covered in solder mask, making it impossible to create a connection. Make sure that all pads have a solder mask opening. You should also consider changing the bomb output to CSV format for easier handling. I also advise you to set the box export as zip to export your files in a single folder. Once everything is according to your needs, click on process job and select the output location. Fusion will create a package with all the required files inside. You can typically upload this file directly into your manufacturer's website to get an instant quote. You can use the CSV board output to source your components. Most suppliers allow you to create shopping carts automatically using your CSV bomb files. Now that our manufacturing files are ready, we can finally order the PCB and the components and wait for their arrival. To start assembling your board, first you'll need some basic tools. At first you're going to need an odd air station. This one is a very cheap and basic one that you can find in any hardware store. I have mine attached to this mechanism that enables me to pull it up and down according to my needs. Another very important thing to have is an air filter. The soldering process releases nocive fumes that you shouldn't breathe, so make sure that you solder your board in a well-ventilated place. Another important thing to have is a soldering iron. Not only to solder true hole components, but sometimes to make adjustments in your board that you cannot do using the hot air station. To keep your board secure while you solder, it's also very important to have a stand like this that enables you to work while keeping your board stable. To place and move your components, you will also need a pair of tweezers. Be sure to buy good quality tweezers. Some bad quality tweezers don't have the tips aligned, making it really hard to grab components and placing them precisely. Since these components are really small, I also advise you to have a magnifying glass, which will make it really useful to inspect your board while soldering it. Regarding consumables, you'll also need some flux, some solder wick, and of course some solder paste that we are going to apply later using a stencil. Another thing to have is flux cleaner. Once the board is assembled, you might want to remove any excess flux that might be left behind. First, clean any grease residues from your board using isopropyl alcohol. Secure the board to the table using double tape. Once the board is secured, you can now apply your stencil. In the spirit of the DIY, 
Today I'll use a 3D printed stencil that I printed on my resin 3D printer. I'm going to fix the stencil using some tape by a reasonable amount of solder paste on one side of your stencil. You don't need too much. Use a squeeze to spread the solder paste over the stencil. Make sure you fill each opening. Remove the excess paste. Remove the stencil using a quick vertical movement. Use the tweezers to carefully place each component onto the pads. Keep the bomb at hand to check for the correct components. I like to place components according to their orientation. This way, I can keep the board fixed while keeping my hand in a comfortable position. Take your time, but don't worry if the components are not perfectly aligned. Now that our board has all the components in place, we are ready to solder it. First, preheat your board at a low temperature. Keep moving it around so that the whole board heats up. On your solder paste datasheet, you should see a graphic with the reflow profile and temperatures recommended to your solder paste. Try to follow these temperatures, but keep in mind that since we are using a hot air station instead of a reflow oven, temperatures and times might differ. Start applying more heat gradually. Once you've reached the melting temperature, you should start seeing that the solder will melt and push the components to the center of the pads. You can use your tweezers to make adjustments to the position of the components. Make sure to heat up all the components until all the solder paste is melted. Once done, you can let your board cool down. If there is excess on some pads, you can use a soldering iron to scoop it out. Remember to keep adding flux as necessary. Turn the board around and solder the remaining USB connector through hole pads using the soldering iron and solder wire. Once the soldering is ready, use flux cleaner and isopropyl alcohol to clean any flux residues. And just like that, we've got a fully assembled PCB. Now it's time to bring this board to life by flashing some firmware on the RP2350 microcontroller. To program our board, we'll use Raspberry Visual Studio Code Raspberry Pi Pico extension. On VS Code, open the extension marketplace. Search for the Raspberry Pi Pico extension and click on Install. The Raspberry Pi Pico Visual Studio Code extension helps you create, develop, run and debug projects in Visual Studio Code. You can see Raspberry Pi Pico extension on the left panel. Under the Raspberry Pi Pico extension, select New Project from Template. In the Name field, select the Pico Board Blinky LED example. On the board type, select Pico 2, 
specify a folder where you want the project to be saved and click on create. Once the project is created, you can now open the Blinky C file to examine the code. Now to program your board using this code, first connect it via USB, hold the boot button and click on reset. The board will enter in USB bootloader mode. Now you can simply click on the run button on the status bar to start uploading your code into the board. A terminal tab should appear indicating the status of the upload. If everything worked well, you should see the following message on your screen, and if you check your board, the LED should be blinking twice every second. That's it, we've reached the end of our journey. We went from concept to schematic, created a custom RP2350 development board using the Silly Design platform, finished our design in Autodesk Fusion, manufactured it, and finally brought it up to life by assembling it. Let me know your thoughts in the comments, and please like, subscribe, and hit the bell button to stay updated on future content. Thanks for watching, and look out for our next project.